I'm very honored to be here today, and particularly honored to have the last word on the conference. Um, first, I was asked maybe I would give an overview of uh, 50 years of practice, which is tempting. Um, and I thought I would talk about the fundamental principles that have guided and driven my work. Uh, the, the, the preoccupation with the tectonics of architecture, its materiality, its expressive power, the potential of what comes to architecture through the exploration of construction methods and systems, um, or the uh, commitment to inventing architecture out of a feeling for its program, for its brief, uh, life intended in a building. How does a building fulfill its uh, underlying purpose. And as far as our practice goes, also there's been the preoccupation with place. How do you create buildings in countries and cultures that are not yours, that, that are, are, are new to you, and make buildings belong? Uh, make them belong culturally, make them belong in terms of the conditions of the place. And that, of course, would be illustrated by a number of projects. But I feel that the order of the day, uh, the thing that's changing our lives as architects, our practices, is the issue of dense urbanism. I was at a conference at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard two weeks ago in which dense urbanism was the theme, and it seemed to me that dense urbanism presents today to us a paradigm shift in architecture. Architecture as we knew it is no longer the same in terms of the issues that we must address as architects. And I would go back to the 1950s when I was studying architecture uh, and reflect on where was it at that point in terms of our understanding of things. And I think it would be appropriate to begin with Le Corbusier, who, together with Siam, with Hilbersheimer and others, first attempted to take the high-rise building as a building block, recognize it that this is the dominant building block of architecture of cities today, and the automobile, and put them together into some urban schema, the Ville Radieuse, the towers in the park, uh, a moment in architecture that was attempting to deal with this new paradigm. And when we now, in retrospect, are able to look back, it is clear that the towers presented represent an oversimplified single typology of building, unlikely to deal with the richness of what we need to facilitate and most relevantly, they completely missed on the notion of the public realm. There is no public realm in the modernistic cities of the 1930s. And I will come back to that later. In 1959, I had the good fortune to receive a scholarship given to one student in each Canadian School of Architecture to study housing in North America. We traveled mostly seeing high-rise apartment buildings, public housing, and luxury buildings. We saw the Le Corbusian model translated. This is Stuyvesant Town in New York. These very extruded buildings, one after the other, with kind of nameless spaces between them. And the counter to that was suburbia, the Garden City, Ebenezer's Howard Garden City, gone berserk, spreading all over the landscape, an American phenomena, I would say, that's here to this day, which just consumes, but in its own awkward way, providing a quality of life, uh, a house with its own garden that people really aspire to, hence the suburban sprawl all over the United States. I came back and decided that for my thesis, I would try and invent a new kind of apartment building reinvent the apartment typology with the naive notion, perhaps naive, that if you could provide the quality of life 
in an apartment building of a house, nobody will want the suburbs anymore, and we will live happily ever after. Out of this came Habitat, which I built under the World's Fair uh, of Montreal of 1967. The motto of Habitat was, for everyone a garden. Each house, each apartment is a house. You get there through a street. It is prefabricated, industrialized product. It's open in three or four directions. It always has a garden, outdoor space. There are community spaces to go with it for the community at large. Factories were set up. The components prefabricated, assembled into place. You see the building now 50 years later. It's a very successful, prospering community. It has the longest tendency of any building in Canada. So as a living environment, it proved itself. But of course, I think it's fair enough to say, this building now turning 50 soon, that Habitat did not proliferate. The next step in terms of my own understanding of, of dense urbanism, I will trace step by step. In 1973, I had the, again, the good fortune to go and travel throughout China. Uh, I traveled with the Prime Minister of Canada when he went to open diplomatic relations and spent a month traveling the entire country. This is Beijing in 1973. There was not a single high-rise building in Beijing. Except for the Bund buildings in Shanghai, there wasn't a single high-rise building in Shanghai. Very few cars to be seen. This was 1973. And as I went back two decades later, this is Beijing today. So in my lifetime, in the lifetime of many of you in the room, a total transformation of scale and density occurred. Densities we never dreamt of 20 years earlier as we were exploring where urbanism is going. This is Shanghai. I will come back uh, to the Pudong area, which Richard Rogers showed yesterday. Uh, we'll come full circle on that one. This is Hong Kong. And if you're doing well in Hong Kong, and you, you might live in one of those. But it's not just Asia. This is Sao Paulo. You can travel in Sao Paulo by helicopter, as I did here for about 40 minutes, and there's no change to the scale. This two- and three-story typology of the 19th and early 20th century completely replaced by high-rise buildings, apartments, and offices, just dumped in the old grid without any rhyme or reason, the density becoming extreme as this is occurring. And with this comes extraordinary congestion. Uh, basically, our transportation systems, the dependency on the car, and mass transit all put together, whether in suburban cities or urban cities, is just impossible to cope with. We are yet to solve the riddle of urban transportation. When we do, it will change our cities. We have not yet solved it. In my opinion, it's not just a matter of more mass transit and less cars. It's a matter of totally rethinking the way we use cars. Four years or five years ago, uh, we decided within the office where we have a research fellowship to revisit Habitat. What, what, what has happened in 50 years? Has construction industry transformed? Do we have new construction techniques? Uh, that might change the riddle. Can we cope with the densities of uh, Shanghai and Beijing? Uh, and uh, we explored this uh, for a period of over a year. We made dozens, if not hundreds, of models. You see here our model cemetery. Uh, dozens of dozens of studies of different typologies, structural systems, and methods. The, the first shocking kind of reality was that the construction industry in 50 years has hardly changed. What has changed is glass technology. You can do things in glass today you could not do 50 years ago. What has changed is building management. We didn't have CAD. We didn't have BIM. But basic building materials, steel, concrete, 
the requirement for fireproofing, the materials available for envelopes, no change. Out of all these studies, we decided to get a little more specific and take on a particular comparative study. And we decided to look at Midtown Manhattan. Midtown Manhattan is generally an FAR of 12. It's pretty dense, maybe not quite as dense as parts of Shanghai, but pretty dense. And so we mapped, as you see on the left, the density, uh, the, uh, typo the uh, land uses. Uh, red here is uh, office buildings, blue is residential, yellow is retail, and quantified in an in a area of uh, uh, 10 square, I mean 10 blocks by 10 blocks, the building volume, building areas that are in that area, in that zone. And then we reconfigured this, as you see on the right-hand side, uh, with the kind of mixed-use new typology. We put the office structures in the loyal layer, the first 25 floors. We cre created a community street on the 25th level as well as on the ground plane. We placed residential above that, and we translated that into a building scheme, uh, 75 stories high, in which most residential uh, units had daylight, had view, generous community space. The office buildings intermingled with the retail on the ground floor. And most important, we wanted to create buildings which did not form walls. There were not barriers. If you built this along the East River or along Central Park, and you happen to live behind it, it's permeable. It is open, the air, the sun, the light goes through. As you can see, not all, but not for every wonder garden on this one, for almost every wonder garden. Uh, because the buildings are extruded vertically, they didn't quite have the porosity of habitat in Montreal, but they certainly went a long way in providing a kind of quality of life within the density of Midtown Manhattan. What's been interesting is that in the past few years, some of this research has translated into projects of reality. And here I stand 50 years after Habitat was completed, in which there were years in which the project was pretty well dismissed as having no relevant impact to housing today, realizing today middle-income housing projects returning back to the principles and quali quality of life uh, that we had explored at that time. This project, nearing completion in Singapore, is in Bishan area, Sky Habitat. It represents 600 units. It's pretty formidable density. It is conventionally constructed with cast-in-place concrete, but there are generous terraces and balconies for all the units. There are three community bridges which incorporate playgrounds, parks, and community uh, facilities. Um, this is one of the mid-bridges with the open space that links tower to tower. And most important, this is not downtown in the luxury district. This is middle, upper middle income housing being built as part of the general private sector offerings, in this case, capital land offering to the, uh, to the marketplace. So uh, here it is under construction, just about to be topped off. Or I think it has been topped off. In Qingwandao in China, in the coastal city of Qingwandao, not far from Beijing, we are building even a much larger scale project along the coast. The city was very concerned that the project would not form a, a wall again, a barrier for the development behind it. Qingwandao has a fascinating building uh, requirement, building code requirement. Every apartment should have three hours of sunlight. That measured in the winter solstice. And I can tell you that with all our 3D tools and all that, we spent a couple of months really exploring the formal and the typological, the apartment types, do they go through the building, to achieve this kind of uh, permeability of light. Um, and again, we are able to achieve this. This is a middle-income housing project. I want to shift a little bit to another facet of dense urbanism, 
which to me is probably, or not probably, is the most urgent issue of the day in terms of how our cities are working. I think what's happened, happened to the public realm today is that the fact, the, build, the high rise building block, as we, the high rise building type, as a, has not been uh, understood or it has not been resolved in terms of how it makes an urban building block. I love this cartoon that shows the, re this is actually from the 1930s, from the days uh, of the modernist movement, showing that the 19th century urbanism is being destroyed here and replaced by these blocks of towers. Now, 19th century urbanism gave us a public realm. It gave us streets, it gave us piazzas, it gave us the kind of places that for centuries provided the, the common place of the city, the place of commerce, the place of interaction. There were many forms. There were the souks, there were the piazzas, there were the gallerias. It doesn't really matter, but the, the, the individual building blocks that made up the city coalesced to create the public place. I think that's no longer true today. The cities, certainly the cities which are evolving in these new densities, these mega cities, basically cannot accommodate street life in the way they did in the kind of congestion and traffic and pressure that there is on the old traditional street or the old square. Yes, we still have parks, but we don't have the public realm uh, as, as we had it then. There have been experiments. This is Rockefeller Center, uh, built in the late 30s in which a great effort was made to extend the public realm of the street into the project. And in fact, Rockefeller Center has a clustering of high-rise buildings which attempt to bring the street life into the project. But the new typology, and I've just at random picked four projects, the new typology today is the superblock, a cluster of high-rise buildings of mixed use sitting on a podium, which is a retail mall. That's the dominant urban typology of the mixed-use downtown area across Asia, across Latin America, and emerging now to every part of the world. And that typology of this, this arrangement, which is private sector, has brought about a number of new phenomena. One is the privatization of the public realm. These are private spaces. They are controlled privately. Secondly, they're introvert. They do not connect one to the other. It is rare that these, unless there's intervention by any planning authority, and we'll talk about that in a moment, they do not connect with each other. They create a world and another world and another universe, each upon itself, not a connective city as it's been historically. And so this poses for us extraordinary questions because, for one thing, it raises the whole question about the effectiveness of planning. Planning heretofore, urban design heretofore, has intervened in the public sector space, in the streets, in the piazzas, in the parks. It's only superficially intervened in the private construction uh, through zoning and regulation. But here we see a situation where that is no longer effective. Now, I want to talk in that context about Marina Bay Sands. And I, it's not about the Sky Park. It's not about the Art Science Museum, which are the iconic architectural elements that have captured the public imagination. Because to me, the most interesting achievement, important achievement of Marina Bay Sands, and I won't show you pictures, you're, it's, you're within it and you've been around it, is that it gave us the opportunity to create a new kind of public realm, which I look back now and say, we have achieved a place which is public, which is a public realm, which has many of the qualities that the public realm should have. For example, it has indoor and outdoor. It has daylight. It has a clear sense of orientation. It connects to the city at every edge of it because there is that continuity to the surrounding areas. And it permeates the project that even though it's private land, although it's not even only private land, on one hand we had the promenade, 
which was the invention of the URA to create a public place around the water. What we did is take our internal spine, our cardo, to sort of make an analogy to the Roman street, and which has the shops in it and the theaters and the other functions and the convention center, and integrate it into a single entity with the water promenade. Hence, we got a place where you can move from indoor to outdoor, where you can go from air conditioning to open air, where you have daylight, where you connect to the city, where you see the city. And to me, these are the criteria that we must achieve as we do these mega projects of 10 million square feet each. I should say one more thing about Marina Bay Sands before we leave it. It would not have happened if it was not for the URA and the planning concepts that were imposed on the project before we even started. Even the decision to fix the price of the land and choose a project out of the competing four finalists based on urban design and architecture criteria is revolutionary. Would not have happened in the United States, I promise you. Highest bidder gets the project, no matter what the quality is. And these criteria included the notion that there is a conductivity to the city that's central. We are working on a project in Chongqing, larger than Marina Bay, 10 million square feet, mixed use, in a very historic, significant place where these questions again arise. The uh, conventional wisdom, as we saw from the many entries, competing entries to get the site, as there were many, many designs done for different developers, was a podium with many with a mall and towers on top. Well, we couldn't escape that formula because it's almost inherent in the program, but yet we attempted, we are attempting as I speak, this is now nearing beginning construction, to address these issues of within that context to develop a new kind of typology. The site is called the Emperor's Landing. It is historic. It's where the Jialing and Yangtze River meet. It's where the city was founded. It is the place of shipping up and down the Yangtze, which in a way became the sort of metaphor for the project. And we ended up with eight towers, residential, office, and commercial, bridged bridge by a, a conservatory, conservatory because of the very tough climate of Chongqing, uh, integrated with a great deal of retail and other facilities, including subway station, central bus station, shipping, passenger shipping terminal, facing the public piazza that's at the tip of the peninsula. But the big moves were to do with the urban design connectivity. The green line is extending the city streets, which are coming in high, onto the roof of the podium as a public park. The red lines are the streets which run into the project and descend towards the piazza. The residential areas face south towards the city and towards the sun, as you can see in the diagram. And most relevantly, and at great uh, controversy, the mall streets, let's call it the gallerias that go through the retail of, of this project, are an extension of the street system of the city. So you see them extending from north to south, and what is the street then becomes, within the project, a glazed air-conditioned galleria. And you see these extending through as the towers hover over them, and you can see here the multiple uses of residential, office, hotels, etc. And again, in the model, and this is the street as it comes towards the project, transforming into a pedestrian way, full of light, extending the geometry of the city streets. So this project, and this is the park, as it extends the city streets onto the roof of the podium, totally accessible public park for the public at large. Now, these things don't come easy. The natural tendency of developers is to privatize and fully control their development. Gated communities, in the, in the kind of extended sense of it, prevail almost to every project. Gated communities and gated projects means you control what goes on in them. So that opening the doors and making projects extrovert 
is taking a risk. It is a risk of urban life. And that is what we face as architects as we have the dialogue with developers on the projects. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, structure that contains all the facilities of the hotel, a public observatory, and recreational space. I'll conclude with a project in which a new kind of public realm is explored. Changi Airport uh, put out a call for proposal, uh, it's about two years ago, to developers and architects to come up with a notion of a new center that would, would connect and unify terminals one, two, and three, and four at Changi. It's placed exactly in the center of the airport by the control tower. And the notion was that airports are no longer the kind of specialized transportation facility. First, they employ tens of thousands of people who spend much of their day there. Secondly, they are well connected to the, to the citizens of the city through a network of transportation. And then there are passengers that come and stay and stay overnight, as you can see in the proliferation of hotel airports and so on and so forth. And so here was a question of how do you do this in a way that becomes a place that connects both passenger and the citizen of the city? And what are the kind of attractions that you could bring to bear in such a place other than the obvious, retail and all the income producing components that will pay for it all? And so as we considered this, uh, I thought, well, we don't need another Disneyland installation nor dinosaur, as one of the proponents proposed, because these things have short lives. They, they change fashion. What could this city use? It would be extraordinary. And we came up with the idea of a great garden, so that the life of the marketplace, the souk or the, or, or the commercial mall, can cohabit with a great public garden uh, gar like the, the old squares of the city, in which people could come and rest and have a good time and have all kinds of installations that would uh, occupy young people creatively and so on and so forth. So in the ring of that space is the marketplace, four or five levels of it. And above it, quite separate from it, as a kind of public gathering space, you have one of the largest gardens under glass in the world, uh, both complementing sort of yin yang the place of, of nature, the place of openness, with the intense marketplace below. And that actually hints to us, I think, a project such as this, of the extraordinary possibilities of how the place in the city can become much richer even as we associate with the 19th century cities which we now envy. I want to come back to Pudong, uh, and I was uh, happy that it came up yesterday in the, in the, in the talk by Richard uh, Rogers, because here we see coming full circle. This was an extraordinary opportunity. 25 years ago, this was fields. So you could say Pudong represented the opportunity to create a new kind of urbanism, a new kind of public place. Uh, the very fact that the, I assume it was the government of Shanghai, had approached architects to do a, a plan, which uh, Richard showed us his own, shows that at some moment people felt there should be a plan that takes the parts and makes them one thing, one greater, one whole that's greater than the parts. But yet it did not happen. What happened is this, a series of very impressive, very expensive developments, each unto itself. Each of these projects, a major tower, and some activities in the base are sort of cohabiting this peninsula with some open space, with lots of infrastructure, but a, but a unified, cohesive urban place it is not. And so this really raises the question of where are we today in terms of the way we practice architecture and practice urbanism in terms of this dilemma. I think that we need to, I think we need to reflect that our planning tools are no longer adequate, that the way we have planned in the past is, is no longer effective. I 
I think one way to express that is that if you look back through the history of architecture, in each era where there was a school of thought, uh, a, a, a school uh, of approach to architecture, it applied to architecture and it had an urban equivalent. One could not conceive of an architecture conception that didn't embody in it an urban conception, so that it became very clear when you design a building, it is part of a city, it's part of the whole. And when you conceive of a city, when you have a certain philosophy about building, you also have a philosophy about, about how it makes the city as it joins other projects. I don't think that's true today. I think most of the avant-garde in our profession today is preoccupied with what I would call fundamentally the object building. And the object building cannot make city. And unless we resolve this paradox, we will continue to be producing urban places which are disjointed and disconnected and not worthy of our civilization. And I think for that, the profession needs reorientation. I also think that our understanding of what urban design is all about needs reorientation. Having taught it for many years, I would say that urban design until now has dealt with the assumption that you can plan land and have some minor interventions through regulatory concepts about what happens three-dimensionally in the city. But I think urban design has to now be conceived and implemented in three dimensions. And it somehow has to apply both to the private and to the public land in question. You cannot plan the city without regulating what happens on the private land in relationship to public land. And that's a new ball game. I think Singapore is probably the most uh, advanced place in terms of thinking in that way. But Singapore also had the advantage that much of the development was being implemented on public, publicly owned land that's being sold. And through the act of selling that land, the planning was controlled. But when you think of cities in which most land is already privately owned, this is no mean feat. And yet, I think we must resolve it. To me, though, how we come together to take all our individual building efforts and make them come together to make a better city is the most exciting thing to explore right now. And I wish on our profession that we go forward with the sense of the city as much as we do about the next wow effect. Thank you very much.